Hey, I would like now to introduce Shireen Benjamin, who's a university lecturer in primary education at Edinburgh University. She's a long-standing feminist, a socialist and a trade unionist, and she sits on the steering group for the Labour Women's Declaration. Shireen will consider the university as a workplace and academic freedom of speech. Thanks, Shireen. Thanks to Susan and thanks to WPUK for organising this webinar and for inviting me. So I'm going to talk this evening about academic freedom and I particularly want to look at academic freedom in the context of universities as workplaces and as workplaces for women. Um, and we often don't think of universities as workplaces, but of course they are. They employ about half a million people um, in the UK, just under half of those are in academic roles. And they're also producers of workforces. Um, the next generations of professionals, public sector, voluntary sector and private sector workers, they're all learning the skills and the values and habits that will take with them into their future workplaces during their time at university. So if we look at some of the statistics about women workers in universities, According to the Higher Education Statistics Authority, which collects data across the UK, women make up a, oh, just over half the workforce, so that's just under half of all academics and nearly two thirds of professional services workers, and a lot of that is accounted for by large numbers of secretarial staff, who are mainly women, which you can see quite clearly um, in this next chart. So the only part of the workforce that you can see where men are outnumbering women is in technician roles um, and women very significantly outnumber men in the administrative roles. So that's where women are. And I want to look in more detail at the sex balance among academics, because this is going to frame what I'm going to argue about academic freedom. If you look at the lowest rung of the academic ladder, which has euphemistically been called here early career. Now, early career academics will almost always be on precarious contracts. Some of them will be hourly paid. Some of them will be on a, um, on a succession of short term contracts, six months, nine months, a year, one after another. And the trend over the last 20 years is for people to spend longer and longer on these precarious contracts and sometimes well over a decade, uh, sometimes even more than that, before they secure an open ended contract, if ever they do. So the next rung up, the next rung from bottom, um, is called established lecturer in this uh, chart. These are people on open-ended contracts. We don't call them permanent. In the UK, we don't have a system of tenure as they do in North America and some most of Europe. So you can still be made redundant or fired on an open-ended contract, but it's got more security than a succession of precarious contracts. And you can see that in both of these bottom categories, there are fairly equal numbers of men and women. But that changes once we start going up the ladder. When we look at the number of professors, which is the promoted grade for academics, men are very significantly outnumbering women. And I'll break that down a bit more by showing you a chart from my own institution, the University of Edinburgh. This comes from our most recent equal pay audit. So the grades you can see running down the bottom there are pay bands. And this chart includes all roles, not just academics, but academics predominate in the higher bands of that chart. So grade six, which is UEO six on this chart, um, that's where academic roles start. And in UEO six, these will be the hourly paid academics. UEO seven, the next grade, grade seven, is where most early career academics on those successions of short term contracts, the six months, nine months a year. Most of those are on grade seven. Some people on fixed on um, open ended contracts get stuck there as well, but mostly these are precarious contracts. And as you can see, women are a significant majority in both of these lower grades. At UEO8, the first of the um, established lecturer contracts, there's almost parity between women and men, but it's the next grade, grade nine, um, where the position is reversed and men start to significantly outnumber women. Now to be promoted from grade eight, which is the lecturer grade, to grade nine, which is the senior lecturer grade, these words, these terms vary slightly between different universities. We call that senior lecturer at grade nine. So to get promotion onto grade nine, academics have to demonstrate they have, I'm gonna quote from the university's grading profile, a well-established reputation in their field. Now remember that phrase, well-established reputation, because I'm coming back to it. So grade 10 at the end there, UE10, is the grade for professors. This is the senior academic grade, and it's where we see the most dramatic reversal of proportions of men and women. 
So promotions to this grade involve demonstrating, and to quote again, a substantial international reputation. And for some reason, it seems to be harder for women to demonstrate these reputational requirements. I'll come back to that. One of the consequences of this unevenness in promotion is that women are not only in less powerful, less prestigious and less secure roles, but they're also paid less on average than men. Um, universities have a gender pay gap, so-called, which is a bit wider than that of the UK as a whole. It's decreasing, but there's still a gap of over 16% between the average earnings of men and of women, with men being paid significantly more. At least I think so, but I am going to come back to the trustworthiness of this data at the end. You'll see it's a gender pay gap. I'll come back to that. Now, there's many reasons that women academics don't get promoted in similar proportions to men. They're much discussed in universities. None of this is new. Everybody knows about these um, things that are going on. Um, so just a few of them. Working excessive hours and attending meetings and conferences often including travel, international travel, national travel, evening and weekend commitments. These things are crucial to establishing an academic reputation. And of course, that's much harder to do and even impossible to do if, you, if you're shouldering the burden of unpaid work, of unpaid domestic work, childcare, caring for others. Um, and it's disproportionately women who do that. Um, so you're already disadvantaging, you're, you're at a disadvantage if you can't do those things. Um, the process of bidding for research funding is highly competitive and it's individualistic. And this goes against the grain for many women who are more likely to have been socialised not to push ourselves forward. Um, another factor is that women academics tend to be found more in the lower status disciplines, such as the arts and humanities, where funding and, in consequence, um, opportunities for promotion are more limited. Um, and finally, where student satisfaction is used as a metric in promotions, which it often is, students tend to expect more from women and they give higher ratings to men. That's well established. Now, there's a host of other reasons. These are just a few. But the key points I think I want to emphasise are that universities keep academic staff and that staff of both sexes on precarious contracts for far too long. And they make promotions contingent on individualistic and competitive behaviour. Now, this, I would argue, is bad for everyone in the sector, but it stacks the odds additionally against women and also, of course, against some other protected characteristic groups. OK, so that's the context. So turning to academic freedom, this isn't the same as freedom of expression. Academic freedom is specific. It refers to the rights of university members to pursue whatever lines of inquiry they choose in their teaching, their research and their scholarship and their wider public engagement without political or other interference. Um, and the UK as a whole has some of the weakest legal protections for academic freedom in Europe. There was a very good um, survey by the UCU in 2017, uh, the union that should be much more concerned about academic freedom than it has turned out to be. I'll come back to that as well. Um, so an early career academic on a precarious contract has precious little academic freedom in reality. If you're on a precarious contract, you need to position yourself within a research and scholarship field which attracts funding and attracts students. You have to publish in high status journals which are controlled by senior academics. You have to chase positive ratings by students and steer clear of any complaints. And the pressures on all early career academics to stick to fashionable topics and currently accepted views on those topics and steer clear of any controversies, those pressures to do that are huge because their next contract and therefore their livelihood depends on it. So in other words, instead of making their own decisions about what to research and teach, guided by their academic priorities, early career academics are forced into decisions that are led instead by what's going to get their work funded and published and approved of by the senior colleagues on who their next contract depends. Now, this applies to everyone, of course, but bear in mind, again, that the odds in this race are stacked towards a more secure contract have already been stacked against women. And if those early career academics do make it into an open-ended post, reputation is all important. Remember those phrases from Edinburgh's role descriptors. A senior lecturer needs a well-established national or international reputation, and a professor is expected to have a substantial international reputation. Again, through your career, this is a powerful incentive which shapes apparent choices in teaching, research and public engagement. 
Now, what I've just described, an over-reliance on insecure contracts and a business-driven model that obliges academics to compete for funding and for esteem, that's a profound structural barrier to academic freedom. It's baked in in the way universities are currently organised and funded. And that's the context where discussion of sex and gender in universities lands. So women's rights and the current discussion about redefining women so that women's rights are based on self-identified gender identity rather than sex. Of course, they have important consequences that need to be seriously discussed in many university disciplines. Universities, particularly in Scotland, where we have this um, gender recognition bill before parliament, universities should be a forum that careful, evidence-based, respectful discussion about the implications of self-ID. But, as many people who are watching at the moment will know, any academic who's critical of gender identity theory and who wants to talk about the implications of self-ID and wants to, um, um, and to do some public engagement on that, those academics face knee-jerk accusations of transphobia and bigotry. Sometimes that's played out publicly in social media, through petitions, through open letters. Sometimes it's played out behind the scenes through complaints to managers, through allegations made on internal email lists, occasionally escalating to abuse and threats. And all these things are things that can ruin a reputation in a sector where, repu where reputation is so crucial to career pro progression. Um, Michael Biggs, who works with Sex Matters, has compiled a list of over 100 instances of such targeting that have made the press. These are just the ones that have been reported in the press. It's the tip of the iceberg. What we don't see in those reports is the targeted harassment um, that hasn't been made public. There's a lot of it, believe you me. And we certainly don't see the self-censorship that comes in its wake. What we don't see is all the research bids not made, the publications not written, the teaching not done, the public engagement events not organised, the teaching done in a way that confirms rather than critiques gender identity theory because of the culture of fear that exists, and especially for women. Um, and I've got a quotation on the screen there, which comes from the website, a website run by the group GC Academia. They've collated examples of harassment and self-censorship that have been submitted anonymously. And they paint a sorry picture of academics and students being targeted, cowed into silence, and university managers determined to look the other way. Now, as people may know, there's a bill making its way through Westminster, the Conservative Government's Higher Education Freedom of Expression Bill, and that seeks to address the climate for academic freedom in universities, mostly in England. A few of the clauses apply in Wales. It won't apply in Scotland, but Scotland does keep an eye on what's happening in England. So it would have an influence if it goes through. But I think it's misguided. And I don't think it will make things any better for women because it frames the issue as entirely one of culture wars and seeks to regulate, um, to insert extra regulation um, instead of changing that culture. So it seeks only to address cultural issues and it avoids the structural issues that I described earlier. Meanwhile, the political left, with a few exceptions, denies that there's a problem with academic freedom, sees only the structural issues and frames the fears and concerns of many women as a distraction, part of a manufactured right wing culture war. So I would argue that both left and right here are missing the point. What we need to do is understand and address both the structural and the cultural issues because they inform each other. Now, before I want finish, I want to return to universities as workplaces and I want to pan back out to women in all roles, not just academics. I showed you earlier a chart labelled gender pay gap. When universities collect data, they do it on the basis of gender, not sex. And when we do that, as Pragna was saying, we introduce ambiguity into the data. We want to properly understand women's position and experience in the university workforce and to do that we have to be able to confidently name ourselves and know that we're measuring the right variable. As Joanna Cherry recently said in the International Women's Day speech in Parliament, what you cannot define you cannot protect and what you cannot name cannot be properly discussed and debated and we need to be able to name women as a sex group in universities as elsewhere because there's so much to be done to improve women's experiences and career progression in universities. We should be able to expect our unions to be able to represent women's interests, but too often they don't. And in one example, 
In 2018, my university, Edinburgh, elected Anne Henderson as our rector. So Anne, who's speaking next in this webinar, stood as the trade union's candidate for that post. Anne's an experienced and effective campaigner, and she had lots of, lots of ideas and energy for working with the campus unions to improve working and studying conditions, especially for women, especially for lower paid workers, especially for students. And she was beginning to do that. But a few months after her election, she retweeted, of all things, an invitation to a WP UK meeting in Westminster. Um, imagine that. And she was targeted on social media and in the local student press with accusations of transphobia, of making the campus unsafe for trans identifying students and staff. The campus unions, including the student union, withdrew their cooperation with Anne, which meant that all the work she would have done to improve working conditions didn't get done. And instead of using her time, energy and considerable experience working for women's rights, she was forced to spend her term as rector defending herself against spurious accusations. It's one of the hidden costs that we sometimes don't see. So the final point I want to end with is the one about universities as places where the workforce of the future is learning what a workplace is like. Our students are in an environment where they see women less represented in higher status roles and overrepresented in lower status ones. They're learning that that's normal and natural and inevitable and unremarkable. And they're learning that women who try to articulate our experiences and needs as women and who argue for our rights as a sex class can expect to be targeted and bullied. And that has implications for all of us for the future. And it's why I think wherever we're positioned, we all need to be concerned about what's happening in universities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Shireen for her a very powerful presentation. There was a quote that really struck me in there. Uh, when the, the a woman academic talked about the totalitarian atmosphere of censorship and misogyny in academia, it's hard to believe that this is the United Kingdom in, in 2022.